Hello, I'm Neil H, and today I'm covering the combat exchange portion of the rules of the Avatar Legends tabletop role-playing system by Magpie Games. This is by far the most complicated portion of the Avatar Legends rule set, and one that many understandably have trouble understanding. But don't worry, my hope is that by the end of this video you'll grasp the ins and outs of exchanges, or you'll have more questions, I guess we'll kind of find out together. Though I will tell you, if you haven't already checked out my basic mechanics video, you're going to want to do that before continuing this one. It's important to clarify up front that not all fights are meant to use the exchange system. Many times, they can be handled simply by the rely on your skills and training and push your luck moves. A general rule of thumb is that you should only use the exchange system when one or more of the following conditions is true. The enemy combatants are not just obstacles and are interesting, complex, and or named. There are actual stakes and consequences for winning or losing. Or, the fight is happening at the climax, the culmination of a plan, or against a meaningful antagonist or villain. Above all though, Game Masters should read their table. If your players aren't interested in the actual fight, then either keep the fiction moving, or resolve it via the basic moves. Another crucial point about exchanges is that they are not meant as just simple I fire blast at you and you get one boomerang throw, none of that. They cover a snippet of blows, blocks, and dodges that uses bending, weaponry, and martial skill. This means that role playing and adding detail is key to prevent the boring D&D trope of I move, I attack, I'm done. Which, speaking of Dungeons & Dragons, it's best to think of a single exchange as all the actions undertaken in a single round of combat. But unlike D&D, the next exchange doesn't have to happen immediately after the finalization of the current one. There is time between each exchange to talk, distract, trick, and generally use the basic moves. The Game Master is the final arbiter of how long this time gap lasts, though usually the next exchange happens when someone directly engages someone else, even if they're just defending maneuvering or evading and observing. So you've gotten this far and you're about to enter into an exchange. At this point, the Game Master and everyone else at the table should clarify the important details of the situation. Things like, what is the environment like, who is fighting, and who is engaged with whom. One of the absolute worst things that can happen is a waterbender not knowing about an obvious source of water until halfway through the fight. The Game Master should also settle on which fighters are engaged with each other. Typically, each fighter is engaged with one other actor when they are in reach of each other's skills, trainings, and techniques, and if they are actively focusing on each other. This means that you're not engaged with everyone present in the scene. You can gang up on a single enemy if you like, but a good GM will still find ways to break up the combat such that there's three or few combatants involved with each bout. That typically means breaking up exchanges into smaller ones, or otherwise introducing complications or enemies to prevent abusing the action economy to take down a single threat. Oh, and uh, one more thing, uh, no surprise attacks here. Such attacks happen outside of exchanges. To start an exchange, every combatant should select one of the following three approaches. Defend and maneuver, advance and attack, and evade and observe. Once selected, the exchange is resolved in that same order, with all defend and maneuver approaches happening before all advance and attack, and all advance and attack happening before all evade and observe. Once chosen, player characters roll the stance move to see how many techniques they can perform. Defend and maneuver uses focus, advance and attack uses passion, and Evade and Observe uses either Creativity or Harmony depending on what the PC chooses. On a 7 to 9, a PC can use one basic or one master technique. On a 10 plus, they choose one of the following instead. They can either mark one fatigue to use a learn technique, use one practice technique, or use two basic or master techniques. On a miss, you can still use one basic technique by shifting your balance away from center. And before you ask, no, you can't use the same technique twice in the same exchange. This isn't explicitly stated in the rules, but it's a question that the Magpie development team has clarified many, many, many times on their Discord server. Just trust me on that and save the sanity of both your Game Master and the devs. Now, you might be wondering about the differences between learned, practiced, and mastered when it comes to techniques. A learn technique is one that a player character has been taught but hasn't successfully used in combat yet. 
A practice technique is one that a PC has been taught and has used in combat. A master technique is one that a PC has fully mastered after completing a special mastery condition that has been set by their teacher. Further clarification can be found on page 211 of the core rulebook, but that's the extent is what I'm going to cover in this video. A few quick things before we move on to breaking down what statuses are and what the basic moves are for each approach. You cannot use a master technique if you roll a miss, nor can you use a learned or practice technique if you roll a 7 to 9. It might also be the case that you cannot perform a technique of any kind if you cannot pay the cost involved with it, such as marking fatigue or a condition. The good news is that a character does not lose their balance or is taken out until after the exchange ends. And do remember that you need not roll into another exchange immediately. Sometimes a fight can be decided in as little as a single exchange if the combatants on one side no longer wish to fight or are otherwise incapacitated, which leads us to talk about statuses. Statuses are specific states that impart mechanical effects to reflect how the environment is affecting a character. Many techniques assign or remove statuses, while others inflict or bestow statuses. It's a subtle difference. It's important to say two things here. One, the fiction must support the status in question. A bloodbender might be empowered, but unless that empowered is coming from the full moon, then they can't bloodblend. Unless they're special, like a certain character in Korra, but you hopefully know what I mean. The second thing is that all statuses take effect at the end of the exchange. There are eight total statuses, four negative and four positive. We'll cover the former first. Doomed means that the character must mark one fatigue every few seconds or each exchange. Impaired means a PC must mark one fatigue or take minus two to all physical actions. NPCs with impaired select one fewer technique. And I'll talk about NPCs later, so don't worry, Game Masters. Trapped means the character must mark three fatigue or conditions to escape. Stunned means the character cannot act or respond for a few seconds or until they recover. And that is the negative statuses. The positive statuses are as follows. Empowered means you clear one fatigue at the end of each exchange. Favored allows you to choose an additional basic or master technique in the next exchange, even on a miss. Inspired can be cleared at any moment to shift your balance towards a principle of your choice. And finally, prepared can be cleared to take a plus one to an appropriate roll or to avoid marking a condition. If you want to get a better understanding of statuses in terms of how to adjudicate them as the Game Master, you're going to want to read through the pages 151 through 153. For now though, that basic summary should suffice for most players. With that said, let's move on to the basic techniques of each of the three approaches, starting with Defend and Maneuver. The three techniques here include Ready, Retaliate, and Seize a Position. Ready allows you to mark one fatigue to ready yourself or your environment, which in turn assigns or clears a fiction-appropriate status of nearby characters or yourself. You're basically setting yourself or others up, and the status you inflict or clear is ultimately up to the GM. So again, make sure to roleplay and provide plenty of detail of what it is you're trying to do. Retaliate forces any foe who inflicts fatigue, a condition, or shifts your balance in this exchange to mark one fatigue themselves. They must actually harm you for this to trigger. In addition, the amount of fatigue or conditions inflicted on you per single technique doesn't matter. It's only if the enemy uses two separate techniques that you inflict more than one fatigue on them for their actions. Seize a position allows you to move to a new location. This is not simply a move action, like in D&D combat. It's a given that the combatants in an exchange will be moving about. Seize a position is meant specifically when you want to go somewhere in particular, or you want to charge towards a new enemy or flee from your current opponent. The former is useful for clearing negative statuses that depend on where you're standing, such as being impaired for standing in the high water. The latter, escaping, is best thought of disengaging from your current opponent while remaining in the fight. If you want to escape the scene entirely, then that takes effect at the end of the exchange. With all that in mind, it's important to note that any foe engaged with you can mark one fatigue to stop you from seizing your new position. Let's move on to advance and attack. Techniques here include strike, pressure, and smash. Strike is best thought of in this manner. If you don't want to mark fatigue, then your target gets to choose whether to mark two fatigue, mark a condition, 
or shift their balance away from center. If you want to force them to mark two fatigue or a condition, then you should mark one fatigue yourself. Pressure locks out an approach of your choosing for your target in the next exchange. This could be backing them against a wall to prevent them from invading and observing, or maybe even disrupting their footing to prevent them from advancing and attacking. If multiple allies all use pressure on a single target, then you can effectively lock that target out of usable moves. However, it's important to note that such an occurrence should be supported both by the fiction and be cleared by your game master, because let's face it, a Locked out enemy is no fun. Smash has you mark one fatigue to destroy or destabilize something in the environment, which may in turn inflict or overcome a positive or negative status as supported by the fiction. Think about your environment and use this to create opportunities for you and your allies. And not every smash is going to impart a status either. The final approach, Evade and Observe, has an important function that occurs the instant you choose it as your approach. Specifically, you clear one fatigue immediately before you make the Creativity or Harmony roll. Once you make the roll, you can choose from the following three basic techniques. Test Balance, Bolster or Hinder, and Commit. Test Balance sees you marking one fatigue to challenge an engaged foe's balance. You can ask what their principle is and they must answer honestly. This means even if they stonewall you in character, out of character they must still tell you directly what that principle is. If, by some chance, you already know or think you know their balance, you can shift their balance away from center. In that last part, if you think you know, then you must name their principle and describe how you arrived at that conclusion to the Game Master. Even if your guess is wrong, you're still going to learn their real principle, so it doesn't really hurt to take a chance and guess. Bolster or Hinder is all about using your skills and training to apply a status effect to a singular character or single group of NPCs. This does not change the environment like Ready does. Most of the time, you will be creating a new status rather than removing an existing one. Ultimately, it depends on the fiction and the Game Master what an appropriate status to apply is, so again, make sure to describe what it is you're trying to do. Commit has you shift your balance towards one of your principles. Then, the next time you live up to that principle, you do not mark fatigue. If you have no idea what I just said, check out the balance portion of the mechanics video. This effect lasts until the situation changes dramatically and is generally a good way to reduce the risk of losing your balance. A quick sidebar on NPCs before we wrap things up. An NPC can select up to one plus their current balance number of techniques in their approach. This is determined at the start of the NPC's chosen approach. That means shifting an NPC's balance can be a risky move as they could then get to act more in the current exchange and in future ones. In addition, NPCs are considered to be masters for any advanced techniques they know. NPCs also rarely fight to the bitter end. Game Masters should rely on the NPC's drives and principles to determine how they react to any combat exchange. That includes how they handle the PC should the party flee or be defeated. But remember, death is the boring option. You can do so, so much better with the fiction. And that is the exchange system in a nutshell. I hope I answered a lot of questions, but I get the feeling I'm still going to get quite a number. In any event, if you like this quick overview, drop a like and a comment below. You'll also want to subscribe and hit that bell if you want to be notified when I put out more Avatar Legends content. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you want to see Avatar Legends in action, check out my Rise of the Dark Avatar game link below.